So I'm just going to review all the problems that we didn't cover in class. So I'll start with example one since we skipped it. I think we skipped another one in there. And then I'll continue where we left off. So in this first example, we've got an object whose mass is 25 kilograms. And the question is, what is the magnitude of its weight on Earth? Uh, and then what about on Jupiter, where the acceleration due to gravity is 2.6 times that of Earth? So let's take a look at this. We'll start with our givens first, right? We have the mass of 25 kilograms. And we know that on Earth, gravity on Earth is 9.8 meters per second squared. And since we're looking for the magnitude of the weight, right? The magnitude, we don't care about the direction. We know the direction is down, right? So here's the object. The vector showing the weight of the object would be downward. The surface it's on would be upward with some normal force, but we're really concerned about what is the weight of the object. So to figure out that weight, let's go ahead and just say Fg is equal to Mg, okay, which is 25 kilograms times 9.8 meters per second squared. And again, this is the weight on Earth, and our answer is 245 newtons. Now, if we are on Jupiter, we have to take a look and think, okay, what can we do here? We could either, hmm, take 2.64 and just multiply it by g, right? If we can get the value of g on Jupiter, it's 2.64 times 9.8. And we can do that. So we could say, okay, it's the same exact process on Jupiter equals mg on Jupiter. And we have 25 kilos. But now again, we have 2.64 times this number, 9.8 meters per second squared. Okay, and we'll get a value of 646.8. What's interesting to note, obviously, is that what could we have just done to go from our answer right to this answer directly? We could have just taken 2.64 and multiplied the value by 245, right? So again, 245 times 2.64 would yield this value here for the weight of the object on Jupiter. So in this example, we have a force of 100 newtons that's applied to a box. The box is at rest on a table, and the force is applied in the upward direction. We're given the mass of the box is 8 kilogram, and it says, will the box move off the table vertically, upward? If so, with what acceleration? If not, what is the normal force provided by the table? So let's start problems as we do almost all of these now with a diagram, right, a diagram. So the force is 100 newtons that's applied to the box. So I'm thinking of this force here as an applied force. And we know the weight of the object pushes down on the box. Well, the box is on a table, right? So let's go ahead and draw that table here. And from that table, we know that the table might or might not apply some normal force. I'm going to put a question mark there just to indicate, like, you know what? This might not be the case, right? It might not need a normal force. And when won't we need a normal force again? When we don't need a normal force, it's when the applied force is more than the weight. So if this value for Fa happens to be greater than Fg, then the object's going to lift off the table, and we won't have a normal force. So before we can even approach F net in the y direction, let's just compare these two values. So we have Fa that's given. That's 100 newtons. We have the mass of the object given as 8 kilos. Well, let's figure out the weight of the object. The weight of the object would be mass times gravity which is 8 kilos times the actual gravitational constant, 9.8 meters per second squared. So clearly this number is going to be less, right? So we have 78.4 newtons. Let me just zoom out slightly to fit a little in there. Okay, newtons. So because the weight acting down right here is less than the force applied upward, we know that the upward force is going to win the battle meaning the object will lift off the table. Okay, will it move off the table vertically upward? The answer is yes. So the first answer is yes, it will move. Now, if so, with what acceleration? So that's our question now. After that, it says if not, but it, it, it did move, so we don't have to worry about this if not part. So this part of the question is over. There's no normal force. 
So if so, with what acceleration? So now let's take a look at Newton's second law in the y direction. We know that the sum of the forces acting on any object in any direction equals the mass of that object, or system, in this case object, times that acceleration in that same direction. Okay, so we have our governing equation. <clears throat> we have a force diagram drawn on the left over here, which is really the same as a free body diagram in this case, because it's, it's only one object. But now that we know that the object is lifting off the table, I'm going to draw the actual free body diagram. Here's FA, and I'm going to purposely put FG as a shorter length here. Okay? And that's our free body diagram. Remember, there is no normal force now because we showed it that it, the object lifted off the table. So when I go to look at my equation in the y direction, I've got the applied force acting up, and I've got the weight pulling back down. And that equals MAY. And our goal is to figure out what is the acceleration felt upward as a result of this. So let's plug in what we know. We have FA minus MG, and then I'm going to divide by M. And that's equal to AY, which is actually kind of interesting. Let's look at this answer if we cancel stuff. And there's a reason I actually put variables, and I didn't just plug in these two numbers here, because I know I could have just plugged those in. So what I want to recognize is this. Take a look. This is the applied force divided by M minus, and then this is just what? MG over M right there? The M's cancel, so this is just minus G. And there's my acceleration. So, huh, interesting, right? Whatever the acceleration is from the applied force would be just FA over M. If I didn't have gravity, imagine gravity didn't exist, right? Well, if I just found acceleration here, it would just be this FA divided by M. So in this part so far, we know that the acceleration from the applied force alone would be this number. But because gravity is pulling down, we're losing some of that acceleration, right? We see the minus sign here, which tells us that. So the answer that we're going to get in this problem, let's see what it comes out to be. We plug in our values, we'll get 2.7 meters per second squared. So this is clearly indicating that although gravity pulled down with 9.8, the applied force in meters per second, really, right? Meters per second squared as an acceleration. The applied force, it itself, was pulling up with causing more acceleration than 9.8 that was being pulled down from the weight of the object. So let's quickly discuss the idea of tension. Um, so tension is a force exerted by a string, a rope, or a wire that is pulled tight, meaning there is tension in the wire. You might say it's taut. Um, and here, really what's happening is this rope or string or wire, whatever it is, it just transmits a force from one place to another. That's really what's happening. Okay, that's what we define a string as, something that transmits a force. So I can think of this in a couple ways. The first, easiest, simplest way to think about it is if I just tie a rope to an object, like a sled or a sleigh, and I'm here, right, and I have my hands on this, on the actual thing, and I'm moving and pulling the sled in this direction. Maybe there's like a, you know, little brother or something on there. So in the rope, which is right here, right, that rope is connecting me and the sled, so it's transmitting my force, because how am I applying a force? I'm pulling on this rope directly, and yet that force goes to the sled itself. Another good example would be um, the classic Atwood machine example, where we've got an object here, and we've got something else, maybe a, a mass, like a, a sphere, metal mass, hanging over a pulley. And here's the pulley right here. Well, that string is transmitting what is really a vertical force downward due to the weight of this object into a horizontal force acting on this mass over here. So we have to consider that fact that you know, it can change the direction of the force that's being applied if it's pa passed over a pulley. So in these examples, we're going to see how um, the tension involved in the problem is one of our equal and opposite pairs. Okay, We're going to talk about how Newton's third law plays a nice role here with tension in ropes. So let's take a look at the next example. So example six says a person pulls a 10 kilogram box by an attached cord. Okay, so we're right into this chord example. Along the smooth surface of a table. Smooth surface. 
The magnitude of the force is 50 newtons, and it's exerted at 25 degrees, at an angle of 25 degrees northeast. Calculate the acceleration of the block and the magnitude of the upward force exerted by the table on the block, or box, sorry, box. So in this case, we have to think about, this is the perfect example of the sled, right? Except now it's a box on a table. So here's the table surface. Here's the box. There's the rope. We know that there's some angle, and then applied to this rope is some force. And that force is 50 newtons, and the angle is 25 degrees. Um, that's really our whole situation. I mean, when we draw a free body diagram in a minute, I'm going to include gravity and the normal force. But on here, this is what they would look like, I guess. It says that it's a smooth surface, and since we haven't started studying friction yet, you can assume this is frictionless for now. Uh, when we get to friction, we'll see how friction would really just be an impeding force in that direction. Okay. Um, so let's take a look at our free body diagram and ask ourselves, what do we do with this force that's applied at an angle? Well, we have to ask ourselves, what does that mean? Remember, if a force is applied at an angle, it means that you're kind of pulling it to the right, right? But wait, you're also pulling it up. So what do we do again? We use components, just like we did with our velocity components when we look at projectile motion. When an object is launched at an angle, we, we broke it into VOX and VOY. So now we're going to replace FA with its components of FAX and FAY. Okay, and I'm going to do it on this diagram here like this. So we can see that those are the components that we're talking about. And then that allows us to kind of get rid of this altogether on our... I'm just doing this again on our, on our sketch, okay? On our free body diagram, I'm going to talk about that in a minute, actually. But the force, remember, was 50, and the x component means multiplied by the cosine of the angle, and the angle was 20, uh, 25, rather. And then in the y direction, we, again, we have the force was 50 times the sine of the angle, which is, again, 25. So those are my values that are acting on that corner of the box, which is interesting because if this were a problem where we cared about rotation, the rope could cause the box to maybe tumble forward. But we haven't learned rotation yet. That'll come toward the end of the year. So as of right now, we don't have to worry about that. So we've got two upward forces, one downward force, and one force acting to the right. So immediately, here's what rings a bell in my head. Oh, unbalanced force. There it is. How do I know it's unbalanced? Because there's no force acting this way. There's no friction. There's no opposition in this, in this problem. So due to that unbalanced force, FAX, we know that there will be acceleration in the x direction. And take a look what it says. Calculate the acceleration of the box. So that's going to come from the x direction. Then in the y direction, we can think about the fact that, you know, the rope is slightly pulling up on the box, which is taking off some of the weight pulling down on it, which means that the table pushing back up, FN, it's not going to have to provide all of the magnitude of the weight. Some of that force will go into the rope pulling upward. Okay, think about like you're kind of lifting up the box with the rope a little bit there. So when I go to attack this problem, I'm going to attack it in the x and the y direction. Okay, now before I do that, let me draw my free body diagram itself. This is what it would look like on an exam. Okay, here's Fn, here's Fg, and here is Fa, and here's theta. Okay, that's how free body diagrams should be drawn. Um, I'm going to emphasize one thing. It's only because I know that some of you plan to take AP next year. You don't break up the force FA into its components on your free body diagram. I personally don't honestly agree with that, but as, as far as grading is concerned, they grade the free body diagram where forces are not drawn as components. So don't break up FA into components. I know it helps. It personally helps me. When I was a student, I like to do it. So I broke it up into components for you guys over here on the diagram instead. And I think that will be at least uh, that'll be enough to help us uh, understand the directions, right? That'll be more obvious looking at it this way. Because now I see, right, upward, upward, downward. It tells me what I'm doing. Whereas here, sometimes I might make a mistake if I'm breaking this up in the middle of my equations. So let's go to the equations at this point. In the x direction, we've got the sum of the forces acting in the x equal the mass of the object times the x acceleration. And then the same thing in the y direction. The sum of the forces in the y direction equals the mass of the object times the acceleration in the y direction. Now, 
We don't know too much about the Y direction yet because maybe the rope is pulling up enough and this force is such a great force that it overcomes gravity and maybe this thing lifts off the table. I don't think it's going to, but maybe it will. And maybe we don't even have FN. So I'm going to leave that for a moment. I'm going to start in the X direction and I'm going to look at what we have. It looks like we've only got one force acting in the X direction and it's the component of FA. Remember, this is pulling up and to the right, which means it's really pulling to the right. So this is pulling to the right. Not 50, which is FA, but 50 cosine 25, which is the X component. So the X component pulls to the right, so I make it positive, and then there's nothing else. So that just equals MAX. There's no opposing force, so there's no minus anything there. And FAX is given, again, right, as FA times the cosine of the angle, and that'll equal MAX. And then what I can do here is I can solve this for AX by dividing both sides by M. We know FA cosine theta is 50 times cosine 25. And then we're just going to divide that by the mass, which is a 10, right? Yeah, 10 kilograms here. So what do we end up getting for this part? Let's see. We're going to get an acceleration of 4.5 meters per second squared. Okay, I'll plug those in so you can see it happening. This is going to be 50 newtons times the cosine of 25 degrees, all divided by the mass of 10 kilograms, and that will equal 4.5 meters per second squared. Okay, so we get a final answer here that tells us that clearly this object is going to get pulled to the right. It's a positive value, right? So it's going to start moving to the right. Now, in the y direction, we have to ask ourselves the next question again is, does it lift off the table, right? That's the really big question here. So let's compute what FAY is right away. And we're doing this because we want to know if this number is going to be greater than the weight of the object. Well, what's the weight of the object? Let's see. The mass was listed as 10. So the weight of the object is just 10 times 9.8. So we have the weight is going to be just 98 newtons. Again, I'm doing 10 times 9.8 to get Fg. But we want to compare that to Fay. And let's see. What is Fay in this case? 50, right, times the sine of, what we have it written already, yeah. 50 times the sine of 25, which is 21.1 newtons. So this tells me that because this applied force upward is not enough to overcome the weight of the object, it won't lift off the table vertically, and we will have a normal force that exists here. So Fn does matter. So when I now look at my forces acting in the y direction, I need to recognize that I have Fn, I have Fay, and I have Fg. And because I already calculated these values, I'm not going to write it all out with variables. It's just a waste of time at this point. I have the values. So I'm going to go to the next step right away and say, okay, I've got Fn acting up, I've got FAY acting up, and we have both of those values already calculated. And, and sorry, not both. We don't have FN. We have FG, which acts down. And because it's not enough to lift it off the table, right? Remember, this force was too little to lift this object, which weighs this much, off the table. Because it's not enough, we know that there'll be no vertical acceleration in this problem. So the answer is zero on the right side. And again, we know FAY, and we know FG. So let's move them over. This is going to be a positive FG minus FA subscript Y. So we have 98 minus 21.1. Okay, 98, which we have up here for FG minus 21.1, which is FAY. 76.9. Again, the problem said what is the magnitude of the upward force exerted by the table on the box? That's the normal force. That's what they're asking for. Okay? So in this next example, we have Tom Cruise again. And this time, he's going to walk across a tightrope from the top of one building to another in order to escape from his nemesis. As he walks across the rope, it sags slightly when he reaches the midpoint. The angle shown in the diagram is 5 degrees, while his mass is 70 kilograms. If the maximum allowable tension in the rope is 3,700 newtons, will it snap? So because we haven't really done much with tension yet, um, besides the one example we just looked at with the rope and the box, I thought I'd start with a free body diagram on here so you can see it. And what's tough to notice, because it's only a 5 degree angle, is that there's actually an angle here. 
of five degrees as well. Okay, think about this um, as alternate interior angles in your geometry course from last year, right? If I look at these, let me zoom in a little bit, hold on. I can see here that this angle here, right, these are parallel lines, and the parallel line is cut by a transversal. So the angle here is alternate interior with this angle, so this must be five degrees. So I'm going to redraw this now, okay, and I'm going to draw it not to scale. I'm going to draw it exaggerated greatly, okay, just so we can see the angle present here. So let's go ahead and put this over here. We've got TR right there at angle theta. We've got TL right there, oops, theta not zero, at the same angle, theta. And then we've got the weight of Tom Cruise acting down. Now, the rope technically has a little bit of weight, but we can assume that it's negligible compared to Tom Cruise's mass um, and his weight, really, I should say. So what we'll notice here, though, is that we have three forces, okay? This is like the three-force problem where we have different angles appearing here. And we have to look at our x and y direction. So just by looking at this problem, because of the geometry and because of the nature of the symmetry that exists here, the five degrees on both sides, because he's at the midpoint, right? That's, that's why this problem's at the midpoint. If Tom Cruise were over here, then the angle would be very little, it would be very different from here all the way to over there, right? It would be different angles, but because of the midpoint, these are both going to be 5 degree sags. Um, that makes the problem a little bit easier, by the way. So let's take a look at why it makes it easier. So let's take a look at the sum of the forces in the x direction. That always equals, again, ma. Because we're really looking at the rope itself under Tom Cruise's foot. This is the spot we're taking the free body diagram around, okay? Sorry, I used the highlighter instead of this. Right there, that's what we're looking at. So we're imagining at that point that there's just a massless position or node, and we've got the weight of Tom Cruise pushing down and the rope pulling back up from that point, okay? And the hope is that it wouldn't snap there at that location. So let's take a look at what this would be, right? This would be zero here because, again, the rope is a point on the rope we're not really looking at anything that's moving here and acting to the left we would have TL but only a component of it right only the X component of TL and we don't know what TL is so we have to leave it as an unknown TL but acting to the left means it's going to be a negative force and because it's the X component we're going to use the cosine of our angle and then look TR is acting to the right with the same angle and the same cosine function because it's the x. And that's what the x direction ends up looking like. That's why I said, you know, this is going to be easy because of the symmetry. The fact that cosine 5 is in both spots, it just drops off. And, you know, right, like I, I could divide the entire equation. Imagine divide this side by cosine 5, divide this side by cosine 5. It just goes away. So those are actually gone in this problem. They don't even affect it. What we get from this equation is the fact that if we add this TL over, we get the fact that TR and TL are the same. And that's really important, the fact that we can equate these two things, again, because of the symmetry involved. Now, with that, we're able to then utilize our y direction a bit more. And let's go to the y direction and see that. In the y direction, we would have the sum of the forces acting in the y direction equals m times the acceleration in the y. Again, because we're looking at this little knot in the rope or this position in the rope, it's not moving. The rope is not accelerating. There's no net force acting. It's all equilibrium. This is what you call the static equilibrium problems, by the way, where in the x and the y direction, both sum of the forces is zero. We'll talk about this as a whole topic of static equilibrium at some point. So if we look at this, we can see acting up, we've got TL, but only the y component, so sine of 5 degrees. Then we've got TR acting up, but only the y component. And then we've got FG acting down and that equals zero. So this is our equation, and if I look at this equation, sure, I could figure out what FG is, but we have two unknowns, TL and TR. So it's pretty impossible, it's impossible, I should say, not pretty impossible, to solve this alone, which is why we take our statement from the x direction. This is the first time we're using what we call a linking variable. Remember in projectile motion, we would link the x and the y direction together with time. Now we're taking this statement and moving it over here. So I could say, all right, TR is TL. So I could just call them both T, since they're the same, and say this is T and this is T. Or I could just use substitution and replace TR with TL. 
So I could just make this TL and then they'd both be TL. Either way, they're the same thing as the idea. Okay, so really I'm just gonna call them both T. So this is T sine five plus T sine five. And together, right, we're gonna have two T sine five. Please don't make a mistake and put sine 10 there. Remember T sine five itself, you know, the way we sum these together is thinking of them having a one on the front of both of them. A one T sine five, another T sine five is two T sine fives. Uh, and then this is minus FG equals zero still. So we can go ahead and solve for T, the tension in the cable. Let's see, we're gonna add FG over, and then we're gonna divide by two sine of five degrees. Okay, I'm gonna add FG over, divide by the quantity two times the sine of five degrees. Uh, I don't have an FG, I just have the answer here. Let's see, the final answer for this, when we plug in for FG, FG is just mass times gravity, so it would be 70 kilograms times 9.8 in the numerator, divided by the quantity two sine five will yield around four kilonewtons, okay? 39, 35, or 36 if I'm rounding to the nearest. Um, well, let's see. Is it going to snap? Yes, unfortunately, it will snap, right? Because what do we know? The tension allowable was only 3,700. So unfortunately, when Tom Cruise hits this point, or at some point in time, probably even before this point, there'll be too much tension in the rope. Here's the tension, right? And the rope or the cable will snap, and he will not succeed in getting across to his other building. I'm sure he'll use some grappling hook and survive, though, so it's Tom Cruise. All right. So in this next example, we've got one paint bucket that hangs from a massless cord and a second bucket that's attached to the first one, again, with another massless cord there. Um, each bucket have a mass of four kilograms and they are at rest. The question is, what is the tension in each cord? Um, and then the following question after that is, if the two buckets are now pulled upward with a given acceleration by the upper cord, what is the new tension, again, in each cord? So let's think about this logically before we even begin the problem, right? We've got the upper cord, which is supporting a bucket, which has more stuff hanging from it, right? More even hanging from it. So there's a likelihood that we'll notice something about the tension here involved, right? What would the tension difference be? And think about it logically, right, before you go into it. Well, then probably you're thinking that the upper cord is supporting two of these weights pulling down on it really, right? So we have both objects being supported by the upper cord. So there's a likelihood that the upper cord will itself end up having more tension in it than the bottom one. But that's again, just by using the context. Let's get into the problem, right? So let's call this A, uh, I'll call them one, and, no, A and B, it doesn't make a difference. A and B. Okay, and I'm only gonna use labels so when I draw my free body diagrams we can see things properly. Um, their masses are identical, and in the beginning, we just want to find the tension, okay? And it's at rest. So the first thing we have to do is draw free body diagrams. If I draw my overall diagram, though, let's draw my force diagram for a moment over here. I know that this tension pulling up on this, I'll call that FT1, and I know that the weight of object A pulls down, FGA. Um, I also know that object B has some weight to it. Now, the middle cord is a little bit tricky, right? What's happening here? Well, the bottom bucket is pulling down on the cord, but the upper bucket is kind of pulling up on the cord because it's keeping B where it is. So what happens actually is this, and this is the odd part. The upper cord feels a pull down on it. F, sorry, the, not the upper cord. The upper part of the lower cord, meaning right here. The upper part of the lower cord feels a pull down on it from this bucket. And that's a new tension. It's not FT1, the same as what was up here, where we're going to look for separately. But the lower bucket, because of Newton's third law, remember I talked about Newton's third law is going to play a role. The lower bucket feels a pull upward with the same tension as this. Okay, so this is the interesting part. FT2s are the same here. Okay? So I've got my force diagram. Now let me draw my free body diagram separately. So object A is here. We know that there's tension pulling up on object A due to the first rope. We know that the weight of object A pulls down on itself. 
And then we also know that there's tension in the second rope pulling down again on object A. Now in the first scenario, we're in equilibrium, so I tried to draw it so that you know this length is equal to the sum of these two. But in the second scenario, then we have acceleration, so it's just not drawn to scale for now. Okay, but again, this is object A. Then for object B, we have to do the same thing. <clears throat> well, object B has its weight pulling down on it, and then it's got tension pulling up on it, but from, again, the second cable. So object B only has two forces acting on it a little bit simpler than object A. And now we have to just look at our equations using Newton's second law. So let's go ahead and write Newton's second law out for object A. Remember, for both of these objects, I should start by saying we have the sum of the forces in the y direction equals m times A in the y direction. But because this is at rest in the beginning, right, before we get to the acceleration part, we could say that both of them have a zero for that. Okay, I'm going to put a zero for both of them there. So in the end, they both become, you know, sum of the forces equals zero. So I'm going to list the forces. we got FT1 for object A. We've got FGA pulling down on it. And then we've got FT2 pulling down on it. Okay, and again, this equals zero. This is object A. Then object B has tension pulling up on it and its own weight pulling down on it. But again, it's in equilibrium, so it's equal to zero. So those are our two equations in this problem. And now it becomes a question of, can we solve a system of equations, which we could easily do, right? We could solve it using substitution, elimination. You could use a matrix. In this case, it's just easy to solve the object B answer first, right? We could go ahead and solve for FT2 by adding over the weight of object B. And that weight is equal to the mass of object B times gravity, which is, in this case, the mass is 4 kilograms times the gravitational constant. And we'll go ahead and get the value of 30, what is this, 39.2. Okay, 39.2. Um, now, once we have the tension in the second cable, we can take that value, right? And now we can go ahead and plug it in right here in the first equation for A. So let's go ahead and do that. We've got 0 equals FT1. Well, actually, let's just let's solve this equation for FT1 first. All right, let's solve it for FT1 because that's what we're looking for. We're looking for the tension in the second rope. Or in this case, I guess it's the first rope. The second one that we're looking at, though. So solving for FT1, let's add over those other forces. So I'm adding FGA and I'm adding FT2. Right? And technically, I'm adding them over to this side of the equation. I just wrote it the reverse direction. So everything becomes positive, right? We're all positive. Great. Well, now we know FGA is the weight of the upper, right, the upper bucket, which is the same exact weight as the lower bucket was, 39.2 from over here earlier. That's the tension or the weight of the lower bucket. So I know that the weight of the upper bucket is 39.2, and we know that the tension... In the lower cable, well, this is 39.2, right? That's going in for tension right here, technically. It's also the weight. So it's another 39.2. So as we suspected, the upper cable is holding on to the weight of both buckets, okay? Which is what gives it an overall force that's double the tension in the other cable we just determined. This is now 78.4. And again, both of these situations are where there is no acceleration in the system. They are stationary. So let me toss a little bit of acceleration in there, right? They're both accelerated now upward with an acceleration of 1.25 meters per second squared. So now we have to consider what happens as a result. The first thing we should notice is that nothing changes in our free body diagram. The only thing that changes really is that since they're now being accelerated, this is no longer zero. So instead of, an a, instead of a zero here, we're gonna put MA, right? And instead of a zero here, we're gonna put MA. And remember, this is the mass of the lower bucket. This will be the mass of the upper bucket. Okay? That's what we'll be looking at in this case. So let's go ahead and take a look at this. So we've got the mass of the upper bucket, A, times its acceleration, which is the same for both buckets. And that equals FT1 minus FGA minus FT2. So again, what am I doing? I'm just rewriting the new situation <clears throat> where we now have acceleration. And the same thing with the second bucket, same governing forces, 
but now this equals the mass of the second bucket times the acceleration of the system. And we go about this problem the exact same way we did the last one, okay? We go ahead and we plug in, we know this, we know this, and we can get FT2. Okay, that's the first step right away. We know these values, this is given, this is given, this is given. So the tension in the second cable now will be slightly greater because now this object or this system is moving up. If we plug in, we'll get 44.2. Okay, again, slightly greater than the tension we had earlier of 39.2. And again, why is this? It's because of this added effect right here. Remember earlier, what did we do? We just took this quantity here and we added it over, and this was our answer. The tension was equal to the weight hanging. But now when we add this over, the tension is going to equal the weight hanging on this side plus this added effect of the system being accelerated upward. And think about that logically. Put, a, put something like a yo-yo in your hand. If you take your hand and pull it upward suddenly, you would feel the tension in the rope being greater. You would literally feel it pull on your finger. So if you pull upward on a rope, that rope's going to have more tension in it if it's at an object hanging on the bottom of it. And that's what we're seeing here happen. Once we get this value for FT2, then it's just easy at this point. We take this value here, we plug it in for FT2. We've got the weight of the object. We have the mass of A, we have the acceleration, and we can solve for FT1. Okay, I'm going to let you guys solve that by plugging in. FT1 will turn out to be 88.4. Okay, again, notice it is exactly double the answer for this one. Okay, so example 9 says two masses are connected by a massless cord over a massless pulley. If the mass of object A is 20 kilograms and object B is 4 kilograms, determine the acceleration of each mass and the tension in the cord. So we have this cord, right, that's connected over here, and we have to think about the fact that it's pulling in both or from both directions, right? It's pulling on object B upward, but it's also pulling on object A to the right. Um, luckily, in this case, we have no friction, so this is a simple example. We'll see this with friction in the next section, and we don't have to worry about that on object A. So object A will definitely accelerate to the right, because nothing else is acting on it. Only friction could oppose its motion, and that would oppose it to the left. But we're not looking at an example with friction here. Um, let's draw our free body diagrams, right? And we could actually label our force diagram first if we want to. When you're getting better at this, you don't have to keep doing these force diagrams every time, right? But I'll put them here so you can see them for now. Okay, those would be the three forces acting on object A. And then object B would have this one and this one. Okay, these would both be called tension, and since it's the same cable, it's the same tension. And that's an interesting thing to note here. Even though the cable goes over the pulley, it's the same tension. And, and that's something we're kind of making an assumption of, actually, because it is slightly different, especially if the pulley has mass to it. And we'll see more of that next year in AP. Um, but for now, we'll say that the tension in the cable is the same because it's a continuous cable. Okay? So here's our situation. All right? And let's take a look at our free body diagrams then. We've got normal force acting up on object A, tension pulling to the right, and the weight of object A pulling down. Then this object here... We've got tension pulling up, and we've got its weight pulling down. Okay, so we know for a fact that this object will fall. It will definitely descend, simply because, again, there is no friction apparent here. So any amount of weight will pull this guy to the right. If it's very, very, very little, it will barely pull to the right. But again, that's assuming there's absolutely no friction. If there's any friction at all here, it could stop the motion of this pulling down. But because we don't have friction, let's take a look at the situation. So I can look at the x direction in the first mass, right, for mass A. Or I could look at the y direction. Well, then for mass B, I could look at, in this case, the y direction. So in this circumstance, I have three different equations of motion. Okay, I've got three equations of motion. Let's see which ones are relevant slash needed for us, okay? Um, in the y direction for B, let's start with that one, just because it's got, I don't know, the only thing acting on B, I guess. Now, what I want to talk about here is the fact that the acceleration of object B, right, object B, when it goes downward, this object will accelerate to the right. Let's just think about that for a second. Does that make sense? Think about it. 
right? Okay. If the object pulls down, the other one will go right. So if I'm going to use the same acceleration for both objects because they're connected together, right? They go over a rope, so I can use the same acceleration for both of them. What I might want to do is one of two things. I might want to say that, you know, this one is going downward, so object B will have a, a negative acceleration there. Or I could call the downward direction positive and say that both of them have a positive acceleration. I can do it either way. It really doesn't matter here. Okay? For the sake of the first time we do this, I'm going to still consider downward negative. Okay, so I'm going to start my sum of the forces here. Let me go ahead and do this slowly. I've got the tension in the cable pulling up on object B. I've got the weight of object B pulling down on it. And then this equals the mass of object B times its acceleration. But again, look, the acceleration is going to be a negative value. So if I'm going to call this acceleration A, this acceleration is actually negative A now because it's going down. Okay, it's the same quantity, but because it's going down, it's a negative, or it's just pretty much the opposite of the directional notation I used for the other mass. I'm trying to be consistent with right is positive and up is positive. Okay, so that's why I'm doing it this way. Next year in AP, I'll probably switch it, or maybe even later in this section or this next section, I'll change up things a little bit. Now, that's the object B equation. Okay. And at this point for object B, um, I don't think there's much we can really do just yet. We could solve for tension there, but we don't know enough information to go ahead and solve because we don't have the acceleration. So I'm going to leave that for the time being. Then I'm going to look at object A. In the vertical direction, I don't think that's going to tell me much because look, this will tell me, watch, well, the weight acting down is balanced by the normal force. So what's that going to tell me? It's just going to tell me that the normal force equals, uh, what is this, 20 times 9.8. So it doesn't even make sense to look at the y direction here. And I'm, I'm noticing this because I have years of teaching, but also by inspection, by looking here, there's no lifting up or down. Fn does not help us with anything here. Later, we'll see how Fn will help with friction. When we do have friction, we'll need Fn, and we'll talk about that in the next section. But for now, the y direction means nothing. So I'm going to ignore the y direction for object A. And I'm only going to look at the sum of the forces acting in the x direction for object A. And that again will be the mass of object A times its acceleration. And earlier I should have put like AB there for its acceleration. Okay, I added a little B right there. But remember that the acceleration of object A is positive, while the acceleration of object B is going down, which we're considering, according to this, we consider down negative. If I had considered down positive, I would have had to make this positive make this negative, and then this would be positive. It'd be like multiplying this entire equation by negative 1, which I'm allowed to do. Right? I can multiply this whole thing and this whole thing by negative 1. It'll switch this to positive. It'll make that positive. It'll make that negative, which inherently would make down a positive direction. Okay. Back to the case over here of the x direction for object A. Only tension is acting in the x, and it's acting in the positive direction. So tension is a positive force here. And that equals the mass of object A times what we're calling the system's acceleration A. Remember, I'm using this right here, right, for going in there for AA. And then really I'm using this right here for going in for AB. And again, I'm using a negative because that one is moving in the negative direction. So now if I look at this, I can see that there is a link to the system. FT is the linking variable. All right, this is equal to FT. So let me solve this for FT and then maybe I could just equate the two that work? I think it will. Yeah, let's go ahead and solve this for FT. FT in this case will equal, I'm going to write this in the proper manner, negative MBA. I'm just moving this negative out in front right there. And then I'm going to add FGB over. Okay, that's the tension. Well, if that's the tension, and so is this, then these two things must be equal to each other. So let's go ahead and set them equal and solve the system. We've got the mass of object A times the overall acceleration equals the negative mass of object B times the overall acceleration plus the weight of object B. The weight of object B is its mass, right? Right here, its mass times gravity. So here's our answer. And our goal is to find out what A is equal to. So let's go ahead and solve this for A. Let's move over and then factor out. We've got MAA. I'm going to move this guy over plus MBA, 
<laughs> MBA, your MBA, and equals MG times B. And what can I do now? I can factor out the A, since that's what I'm solving for. And I've got MA plus MB, and that equals MB times G. And then I can just divide both sides by MA plus MB, and I'll get A equals, again, MB times G over MA plus MB. Okay, all those values are given. MB was 4, G is 9.8, and A is 20. Okay, and remember, G is 9.8. We're always plugging in a positive 9.8 here. So the answer would be 1.63 meters per second squared. And is that it? Am I done with the problem? I'm halfway done, right? It says determine the acceleration and the tension. Well, the whole system is accelerating together because there is tension in the rope. So the acceleration of each mass is the same. So that's already circled. But now I need to find the tension. So let's take 1.63 and plug it back in here for acceleration. We can multiply that by mass of object A. And as a result, we'll get a tension value of 32.7 newtons. Okay, I could also obviously have done what? I could have plugged this back in up here and then solve for this tension. And it'll be the same answer, but it's just more work because I have an extra term there. So I decided not to do that, but it would be the same answer for tension independent, uh, independent of which expression you plug back into being this one or this one for the A value. So it's worth mentioning here that we could have treated this entire setup as a system. And I want to discuss that for a moment. And the idea here is that if we didn't care about the tension and only wanted to find the acceleration, we could determine that value. So let's take a look at this as a system. Well, if I think of it, I think of the system as something that's moving here in the clockwise direction. And I think of the clockwise direction in this case as my direction of motion. And I say all my force is acting in that direction. Well, if I look at my diagram, FT in this case is acting in that direction. Well, FT here would be acting against that direction. So those would kind of cancel each other out, right? Newton's third law, they cancel. And then F. GB is acting in that direction. Notice that these two forces are not acting in this direction, right? Remember, the direction of the system, if you follow the cursor, I'm saying is like that, okay? So as a result, what we'll notice here is that we could look at the total sum of the forces on the system, and this is an approach sometimes taken in more complex problems, and say so that equals that the whole mass of the system times the entire acceleration. And in this case, we're looking at the acceleration that we got as an answer down here of 1.63. So if you want to try that, you can. And, and just to give you a head start, it would be, again, we have a positive FT. And then this FT would be against the motion of the system, so a negative. And then in this case, this would be like a positive FG for the second object, so B. Okay, positive negative, those would cancel, and then a positive FGB. If I'm considering, again, I'm just saying that the system is moving in that direction, so I'm calling that the positive direction. Because it's a counterclockwise, or it's a clockwise direction, really. But I'm just saying that that's positive overall. And that will equal here, again, the total mass. So we have mass A plus mass B. Oops, let's move that over. times the acceleration of the system. Go ahead and just determine that acceleration, cancel, cancel, and solve. And look at your result. It's the same exact result we had. Take a look here. This is the weight of object B, FGB. And look, it's the sum of the masses, the sum of the masses. So it's a quicker way to get the acceleration only, right? Again, this being mass of object B times gravity all over this term here. MA plus MB, and that equals A. <clears throat> um, so, just to point that out, it's quicker. But you don't get the tension, right? So if you needed to find the tension, then you would have to look at a free body diagram for just one of the objects, and that would be talking about, like, object B right here, and then you can take a look at its equation right here, and here you can solve for the tension now, now that you knew the acceleration, right? If you, if you solve for the acceleration in this method, you would have 1.63, which you could then plug in here, and then as a result, you could find the tension and you would get the same answer we had earlier. 
I have 32.7 newtons. So example 10 is similar to example 9, but now we don't have the right angle. We have just the two objects. So both of their weights will play a role here, right? The, the crate and the mass, instead of the other one where only one of them did. So the box is 15 kilograms. It's at rest, connected to the cord. The object hangs on the other end. The object must be, you know, being held right now, and then it's released. And when the object is released, the question is, uh, will the box be lifted off the surface? If it won't be, what would the normal force on the box be? If it does lift off the surface, though, what would the acceleration of the system be? And that's almost a hint there to maybe use that system approach that we just looked at. So we could take both directions here and look at the regular approach by the FBDs of each object, and it will work. Um, but we could also look at the system approach, and for that, we could ask ourselves and say, you know, the whole system might be an easier approach to, to gauge. Um, and again, because we're not looking for the tension here. So I'm going to start with the normal approach, but, you know, I'd like you to, if you want to skip ahead and skip the normal approach and just see the system approach, feel free to do that, and I'll, I'll try to cover that toward the end. So let's start by calling this object A, and let's call this object B. Um, we want to recognize right away that object A might have a normal force acting on it, right? That question of it. So when we look at object A here, we're going to put acting up. We've got a normal force acting up on that. We've got the tension in the cable pulling up on it. And acting down on object A is its own weight. Okay, remember this is a maybe right here. We're not sure. Then object B only has its weight pulling down on it. And the same cable right it's over a pulley so we could put ft again we don't have to we don't have to distinguish ft1 or 2 uh, because we have a massless cord and a massless pulley you're always going to see that in these problems that it says that because if the if you if you accounted for the weight or the mass of the cord it slightly would be different tensions on both sides okay so that's good to keep in mind um, so now we have to think about our equations and we have to say in the y direction for each of these right do we have acceleration so we've got Ft acting up plus Fn acting up minus Fga. And that's going to equal the mass of object A times its acceleration. Okay, well, for object A, it's going to probably accelerate up that way if it's going to. It's not going to go down, right? We could all agree on that because it can't go through the floor. So if it accelerates upward, we're going to consider that the positive direction for A. So when A goes up, which way would B go? Yeah, that's right. B, B would go down there, right? B would definitely go down. Think about that as the system rotates. So B would be moving in its negative direction. So when we denote the acceleration of object B, we should probably do what we did last time, where we make one of them A and one of them negative A. Or again, we could call the negative direction, or the, sorry, we could call the downward direction over here positive for this. But sometimes that confuses students more. So I'm going to stray away from that still. Um, and for object B now, I'm going to draw where we have FT acting up on object B. We've got FGB acting down, and that's going to equal the mass of object B times its acceleration. If I take these away now, though, and think of them and say, you know what? Object A is accelerating positively with some A value. All right, so let's call that A then. Well, object B has the same A value because they're moving as a system, so they both accelerate with the same value. But it's moving downward now, right? So we're going to again use that negative A indicating that it's going with a negative quantity of what the other positive A is. Because if I put a 3.5 in here, what does this have to be? That has to be negative 3.5. Okay, just think about it that way when you plug a number in. It has to be negative, so that's why that sign is there. Next, we have to ask ourselves, if I think about this as two freely hanging masses, the heavier one would cause it to rotate, right? So is object B heavier than object A? So since the box object A is 15 kilograms, right? That's the mass that's given up here. We can multiply that by 9.8. Um, and we're going to get 147 approximately newtons. And the weight of this object, object B, is 300 newtons. So 300 to 147, pretty much double the weight. So this guy is definitely going to accelerate down and lift the box up, which tells us now we can drop off the FN. Okay, again, that's the key here. We have to think and ask ourselves logically, will the object lift off the ground when mass B is released so that it can fall down? So let's go ahead and recognize now that we have FT in both equations. 
and let's go ahead and solve for ft in both. Here we get ft is equal to ma times a plus fga. Now, remember, we're going to move this over, but fg is really mg. So let's write it as ma times g. And then in the second equation, down here we're going to get ft is equal to negative mba. And then I'm going to add that over now, right? I'm going to add this guy over. And we're given that value, actually, I think, right, object B? We're not even given the mass. We're given the direct weight of it. So I'm going to leave it, actually, that way, which I guess it is kind of odd, but I'm going to leave it that way. Again, because we're given the weight of object B, while earlier we're given the mass of object A. So just so I have the right variables here. Um, it looks like we're going to need the mass of object B anyway, right? Because, look, if I see right here, we need the mass of object B. So we can figure it out because it's, again, 300 divided by, in that case, 9.8. Let's go ahead and recognize that these are both FT, though, right? So this and this, we can equate those two now, and we can go ahead and solve. So let's do that. So we'll eliminate FT from the entire system or the entire problem by doing this. We'll have MA times A plus MA times G equals negative MB times A plus, and I'm going to put the mass in here now, I guess. I'll, I'll write it with mass, mb times g. I'm, I'm replacing this with mb times g. Um, then we want to solve for a, right? We're looking for the acceleration of the system, right? If it does lift off, what is the acceleration? We're no longer looking at the normal force part of the problem. So let's solve for a by grouping things appropriately. We have ma times a. I'm going to add the mb times a, right? So I'll take this and add it over, and then I'll subtract this guy over here. So this will be mb times g minus ma times g. And then at this point in time, what we can do is we can factor out the a. So there's a good amount of algebra involved right, when it comes to rearranging. And then we can solve for a. And take a look at this answer. It's very similar to the last problem, isn't it? Yeah. Okay, we divided by the sum of the masses in the last problem. Oh, look at that. Now, the only major difference is that we've got two weights up top that are being divided in this case. Okay, it was a little bit different for the last one. Um, so what will that turn out to be? Let's plug in all the values that we know. After we plug everything in, we're going to get 3.35 meters per second squared. Okay. Remember that MB is not actually given in the problem, so that is something that you would really need to determine, but that is not hard to determine. If the weight of object B is 300 newtons, then the mass of object B is simply going to equal the 300 newtons divided by 9. Now, we also said we can look at this problem as a system instead, so let's take a look at that approach. Um, if you prefer the way we just did it and you're confident, you don't have to look at the system approach either. So you could skip ahead to the next problem at this point. But I'll put the system approach down just so we have it anyway. Okay, And I'll put the system approach above it. Um, and we'll see that we'll get to the same answer. So as a system, if I look at this, I could think of this direction to be the positive direction for the system. Because I know that object B is heavier than object A from what I just did. Or I could figure out that object A comes out to be 147 when I look at the weight of object A. Right? That's what we said earlier, 147 newtons. So it will definitely accelerate in the direction of object B. So if I take a look at the overall system, I could see that from object A's perspective, I've got its weight pulling down, and I've got the tension pulling up. But from object B's perspective, oh, I've got this tension pulling up again, and this weight pulling down. Now remember, we're looking at directionally clockwise or counterclockwise. So everything going in this direction is considered positive. So this is positive and this is positive. Everything going in this direction, this guy and this guy, are considered negative. So if I look at the sum of the forces on the system, and set it equal to ma, and this would be the mass of the system times a, the sum of the forces would be a positive fgb, right? Because this, again, is pulling the system in that direction, that's this. This FT is negative. Again, look what happens. This FT is positive. Again, FT is considered an internal force if I look at the whole system. And then finally, FGA is pulling down like this, which rotates the system that way, which makes it negative. 
and that'll equal MA plus MB times A. And then we can go ahead and solve, and this is what we'd end up getting. It's the exact same solution we just had. These cancel. What do I end up with? The mass of object B times gravity minus the mass of object A times gravity all over MA plus MB. So look how much quicker this is now. It's the exact same solution we got whoops, a bit earlier down here, right? Same solution that we have right here. So the system approach is a lot quicker when you are specifically only looking for acceleration of a system because all the internal tensions, those tension forces, they cancel out with each other. So whenever a problem simply asks you about the entire system, I think you can jump right to the system approach and you can get through it a lot faster. Um, this is not something that I did a lot when I was a student. It's something I actually learned more of as a teacher. So I'm introducing it to you guys because I think it is a nice approach to take. The last thing to note is that this setup is called an Atwood machine. Okay, an Atwood machine where there are two masses hanging over a pulley. Um, similar to the one earlier where we had a pulley and one was on a surface though. Um, the general solution for the Atwood machine is exactly what we just derived right there. Whichever mass is bigger goes in the beginning of the solution over here. And that's the only difference. The smaller mass goes over here. So the general solution is written with like a big M to indicate larger mass minus or larger weight minus smaller weight over the sum of those weights. And that's like a generic solution that you could probably... I'd probably like, keep it in a calculator somewhere at some point in time. It might come up. Maybe as a multiple choice somewhere. Um, on like, you know, an AP exam or something. Probably wouldn't make this a multiple choice on your regular test here. And then the tension in this kind of a system is 2 times G times the first mass times the second mass. In this case, we have A and B in our problem. Divided by the sum of those masses again. Okay, so those are the generic solutions for an Atwood machine. And an Atwood machine, again, consists of simply two objects hanging over a pulley like that. Okay, the one that we saw earlier where it was a ledge and then it hung over, that's a modified atwood. Here in example 11, we're trying to look at the tension in each chord, and this is another example of a static equilibrium that we talked about earlier, where all the sum of the forces is equal to zero for all of the different things. Um, so what's interesting to look at is that we can have a couple different free body diagrams here, so bear with me for a moment. The thing I want to point out is that we've got a couple forces acting in this diagram. So let's figure out what this is. We've got the weight acting down from here. We've got tension pulling up from here. Then we've got tension pulling in this direction from the ceiling, which then pulls on the ceiling itself. That pulls on the ceiling, and the tension pulls back. And then there's also tension pulling there. So we've got a lot going on. I can't do a free body diagram of the ceiling. Okay, because the ceiling is structurally sound somewhere else and there's other forces holding it. But I can look at a free body diagram of the knot right there at the middle and say it's got three forces and it's not moving so it must be in equilibrium. And then I could take a look at the free body diagram of this mass. So I'm going to look at the knot and I'm going to look at the mass as my two different free body diagrams here. So we can start with the free body diagram of the mass and we have its weight acting down, Fg. We've got the tension, let's call that again T3, according to our diagram acting up. And then the free body diagram of the knot. We have T2 acting here. And we've got T1 acting here. We'll have to label those angles in a moment. And then we've got the tension from T3 pulling down. Um, just because this is in a state of equilibrium, we can say already that these two got to be equal to each other, right? So my free body diagram is not drawn that well. In that area, I should really extend this arrow a bit more. Um, but that is nice to know, that T3 is already equal to mg. So T3 is going to be 8 times 9.8, .8, okay, or 78.4 newtons. Do I really need to go through the hard work of evaluating that? I really don't, because again, look, these are balanced, right, with each other on that, di on that diagram there. There's nothing else acting. So I know that they have to be, and because I'm in static equilibrium, nothing is moving. Now here I have to do a little bit of work, right? Because I have to figure out these components and vectors. So let's figure out what's going on with the problem then. So let's take a look at the diagram here, right? 
angle theta 2 here is the same angle as this is right here, right? We have to think about drawing a line. And I'll, I can draw it in, actually, to make it easier. Okay? These are alternate interior angles. That must be theta 2, and this must be theta 1. So it's easier to draw it that way in the diagram as theta 2 and theta 1. Because remember, we want our angle with respect to the nearest x-axis on that vector. And since this vector starts at the ro uh, rope and it extends this way, we want this axis, not this one over here. It would work still, obviously, because it does happen to be the same angle, but we'd have to think about it backwards. It'd be really be the force coming from the wall, which we're not looking at right now. So with that said, we can take a look at T1 and T2 in the x and the y direction. If we only look at T1 and T2 in the y direction, we'll have two unknowns. Um, so we'll have to look at the x direction also so we can get a system of equations. So let's go ahead and do that. So we'll say some of the forces in the x direction equals zero. Again, we're always in static equilibrium here, right? So by the way, this was the mass. And this is the knot that we're working on now. So for the knot, <clears throat> we've got T2, right? And it's pulling to the right at an angle theta 2. So to the right is a positive in the x, and it's cosine, right? So T2 cosine theta, and it's going to be theta 2, which is a specific angle. Then it's going to be subtracting right here, T1 pulling to the left and up at an angle theta 1. That's going to equal 0. So unfortunately, that introduces two unknowns there, t2 and t1. We have theta1 and theta2. That's given in the problem. And then in the y direction, we have to look at the same thing. Some of the forces in the y direction equal 0. And in the y direction here, besides t1 and t2, and we're going to take the sign of both of them because the y components, we also have t3 pulling down. So T1 is pulling up, and it's the Y component. T2 is pulling up, and it's the Y component. And then T3 is pulling down, and all of T3 is pulling down. And that equals zero. <clears throat> so plugging in what we know at this point, we'll take a look and see that T1 and T2 are unknown in both situations. So it just makes most sense at this point to either use a system, and I would probably even do this on my calculator with a matrix. I think it's the easiest way to do it. Or you'd use substitution. Um, but remember, you have cosine theta 1, cosine theta 2, sine theta 1, sine theta 2. All those values are known, and so is T3. So at this point, you could even just plug in all the numbers you know and then look at the system that way and find out how to solve it. Okay, for the sake of time, I'm going to let you guys solve T1 and T2. And what we'll end up getting for T1 and T2 are the values. Let's see. T1 is 77.7. .7. And T2 is equal to 72.1. And let's also remember that in this case, theta 1 and theta 2 were given in the problem here. Theta 1 was given as 35 degrees, and theta 2 was given as 28 degrees. And then we have M, the mass, and that only really played a role where? Right over here, right? Where we use the mass of 8. After that, it was just the angles that played the role, right? All the T's unknown 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 and then this was known from this part right here we plugged in 78.4 in for t3 all right so the last example a small mass hangs from a thin string and can swing like a pendulum you attach it to the window of your car when the car is at rest the string hangs vertically what angle does the string make when the car accelerates at a constant acceleration of 2.5 meters per second squared what angle does it make when the car moves at a constant velocity of 75 miles per hour? So let's attack this right away with a free body diagram. It's going to swing back. We already said this. So it's going to look something like this. Okay, And that angle is going to tell us a lot. Traditionally, in these problems, we measure this angle right here. Um, today, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to not measure that angle, but instead I'm going to measure this angle today since we're more used to using that for now. Um, and then I'll talk about the other angle, okay? So that's the triangle that I'm looking at when I think about this. So here's the mass itself, and it's got its weight pulling down on it. And then we know the tension in this cord acts this way. And this is our angle here. And we can label this FT. 
So what's happening here? Well, FT is in the northeast direction, so it's pulling to the right, and it's also pulling up, right? To the right and up. And what does that tell me? The upward force pulling up balances the weight, but the pull to the right occurs only because the car is accelerating forward, okay? And that's that acceleration that we have here. So you could probably imagine what the answer to this is already, if you think about it for a moment. If not, we'll get to it toward the end. So FT, that value gets split up. So in the y direction, we've got FT times the sine of theta minus FG in the y direction. And that's going to equal 0 because vertically, this pendulum, right, this pendulum here is stationary. Then in the x direction, we have FT cosine theta, and that equals M times A. So what we can do if we look at this is we can solve for FT as a linking variable again and see if things cancel out along the way. So I'll solve for FT, it doesn't matter which one, and for this example I'll solve for it in the Y direction. So that's going to be adding FG over and dividing by sine theta. Right? Add FG over and divide by sine theta, and that's the first equation up here becomes that. So then I'll take this expression and I'll plug it in right here for FT. Let's go ahead and do that. It's going to be FG over sine theta, right? That's what's in here, times the cosine of theta equals MA. Let's continue this idea. This then becomes, let's see. FG is really MG, and then we've got cosine and sine here. Well, that's convenient. We can think about what to do with that in a moment. And then on the right side, we have MA, so that M's cancel. Now, what are we actually trying to figure out? We're trying to figure out what the angle is that it makes with the car, so or with the vertical, rather. In this case, you can write this as cotangent, if you're familiar with that, or you can move things around and write it as tangent, which most students are more familiar with. So I could multiply by sine over here and divide by cosine down here. Right? And this becomes G on the left side that's left over. We've got an A over here, and then this becomes sine theta up here over cosine theta down here. And then sine over cosine is tangent. I'll move the A down. We have G over A. And then sine over cosine, which is left over here, once this A moves down, becomes tangent theta. So theta is the tangent inverse of G over A. So of 9.8, right, and the numerator is G, that'll go in right here, 9.8, and A is 2.5, that's what it's given us. We'll get an angle of 75.7 degrees. And remember, that's the angle in the problem right here okay so traditionally I, be, I will say it is given with the vertical in a lot of problems in books just for a heads up on that so you can do it either way you can do it the way I did and use this angle instead but the answer would be 14.3 degrees if we're looking at this angle up here now for the next part it says what angle does it make when the car moves at a constant velocity I mean you should think about it logically if you're cruising you don't feel a force at all so it would just be hanging there perfectly but if you want to see mathematically, you know, look, set A equal to 0, right? Set this equal to 0. Why do we have to set that equal to 0? Well, because think about it. Uh, the acceleration is 0 when we're moving at a constant velocity. So as a result, we can put a 0 there. What will this become? This will say that the tangent of theta, actually, I'll use this line right here, okay? The tangent of theta equals 9.8 over 0. Well, we can't do that. You can't divide by zero, right? But if you think about it, actually, tan of theta, what is that again, right? That's sine of theta, really. So this is really equal to sine of theta over cosine of theta, right? That's what tangent is, so forget that. So this tells me that the sine is 9.8. Okay, but when is cosine zero? Hmm. Cosine function of some unknown theta is equal to zero. Or not zero degrees, but just zero. When? When theta is equal to what angle in this case? And the answer is 90. Cosine is equal to zero when theta is equal to 90. This is from your uh, 
um, reference angles, right? Your reference angles. It's one of your main ones. You have 0, 90, 180, 270, 360, plus the 30s, 45s, and 60s, all those multiples. But in this case, the answer is that theta is 90 degrees. And what does that mean? Well, look. Think about the angle. If this angle right here is 90 degrees, it's not actually like that. It would be like this. Right? It would be the bob hanging like this perfectly. And look, the angle itself is 90 degrees right there. Okay? Um, so just a little bit of a conceptual idea that the answer is it's going to hang straight down, or mathematical that the answer is 90 because this is the angle theta we were looking at, and that's a 90 degree angle with the horizontal there.